Hi everyone, this is Emily, your County Liaison, and Carol from our Division of Food and Energy Assistance. And Carol, I'll let Carol introduce herself and her role there, but we're delighted that you're here to join us about the new Food Assistance Rule Rewrite and that process that we've been going through as a department. We welcome any questions or feedback that you all may have. Please uh, use the questions function on your um, on your webinar and we'd be delighted to answer them. So Carol, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself really quickly. Hi, I'm Carol Spink and I am with the State Food Assistance Policy Group and I've been selected to give you this information today. Thank you. How long have you all been working on the rewrite? This has been going on for over 14 months now. Wow. Great. Well, we'll let you get launched in. If anyone, like I said, has any questions, please feel free to either use the chat function or the questions function. All right. So next screen, next one, right? Yep. Okay. So just as a brief history, um, there haven't been any comprehensive revisions for nearly 30 years to the food assistance regulations. And the past revisions that we did do were limited only to portions of rule contributing to a flow that isn't user friendly. So um, in the past, previous guidance has been primarily communicated through agency letters, and those agency letters were not promulgated into rule. The revision that we have today reduces approximately 500 rules to approximately 300 rules. So the scope for um, it's not advancing. Okay. So the scope for phase one, because since this hasn't been reorganized or rewritten in so many years, uh, we're going to do this in phases. So for phase one, we reorganize the rules into a more user-friendly order. And what that means to us is that it's meant to be more intuitive for the eligibility worker by using titles that more clearly reflect the content contained within and that follow the flow of the application process. We removed duplicated and outdated language and terminology. We corrected incorrect rules. And we are clarifying the most commonly used and misunderstood rules. Okay. So when we started this process, we wanted to get stakeholder feedback. So we did, we conducted six full day work sessions over the course of 13 months. Four of those sessions were conducted with eligibility staff and two sessions were conducted with county investigators. Stakeholder representation was formulated through the OES subpack group. So we got a good representation of all the counties. Meaningful policy clarifications. So no large scale changes are occurring, are occurring to eligibility determination and county processes. Much of the clarification that we added is based on federal clarification that we received. And many of the clarifications were previously communicated to county departments through agency letters. There is an attached food assistance rewrite summary, and that summarizes all the meaningful rule changes. So we're just going to talk about a few today. And we have a copy of those that summary if you all would need us to email that to you. So um, let us know if that's what you need. Most meaningful changes. Um, we decided that we will accept client declaration of shelter expenses, which will increase the efficiency in making eligibility determinations. Before we decided to do this, we really looked at the fact of whether this would increase our payment error rates, which as you all know, have been increasing and we are uh, getting dangerously close to a 6% error mark in the state. And if we reach that 6% error rate, then we will be fiscally sanctioned by the federal partners. So we really did a lot of research into this before we decided to adopt this option. And 
what we found was that a lot of the uh, payment error rates were not associated with this change, that it will increase the efficiency in making eligibility determinations, but we are going to need to do a lot of training around this, most in the area of interviewing. So if we can formulate our interview questions with our clients and help them to understand what it is that we need. So instead of just saying, what's your rent, what we really want to know is what portion of the rent are you responsible for paying. So we're going to really focus on training our workers in how to do effective interviews with our clients so that we can pull this information out of them and get accurate representation of what their shelter expenses really are. Once we do that, then this will really clean up some of those payment error rates that are associated with getting shelter expenses in the case file, but not acting on them timely. And this should help bring the payment error rate down quite a bit. One of the other meaningful changes that we did, we obtained a federal waiver to allow monthly work hours for students to be averaged. So with this change, with student eligibility, the way that the rule is written is that they must average 20 hours per week. And there wasn't, there wasn't an average determined in there. They, have to, they had to work 20 hours a week. So we obtained a federal wa waiver to allow monthly work hours for the students to be averaged over 80, month, 80 hours per month. So if I work 20 hours one week, I work 15 hours the next, I work 25 hours the next week, as long as it all comes out to averaging 80 hours in that month, these students will be now eligible. So what we believe is going to happen is that some of the students that were previously determined to be ineligible because they couldn't meet that 20 hours every week, they will now be determined eligible for benefits. So these will have the most positive effects for eligibility workers and for our clients. The new rules will be effective September 1st, 2014. And what we are envisioning to get all the information out to the workers that need to uh, know of these new rule changes is that we are going to post these rules to the, our website, probably to our portal. Um, the food assistance tab on the portal. Then we are going to also post the summary of the rule changes so that eligibility workers will have an opportunity to look at these. And then we are tentatively going to schedule a Q&A session for all of the counties to attend. So it will also be in the webinar format. Hopefully we're going to have a web-based training as well with this. And we will um, just answer any questions that are really outstanding as far as what these rule changes mean for the eligibility workers. So We're going to ask for the questions to be sent to us in advance so that we can have good answers for you. Great. And I just want to clarify, so the, the portal, the county portal that Christine and I maintain, is not the portal that Carol is referencing. It's the CVMS portal. Correct. So, um, but we would be happy once there's more information or the rule, you know, once the rules pass, we'd be happy to post those rules on our portal as well. So. Perfect. All right. So for future phases that are planned, we're looking at more comprehensive revisions. And our upcoming change is going to focus on clarification for rules on fair hearings, claims, intentional program violations, and fraud. And these areas of the rule require much more policy analysis and development work, and so that's why we've kind of not addressed those in this phase one, but will address them in phase two. Right. And I think that's all I have for you today, so I'm willing to entertain any questions. I just wanted to keep this real broad for you. Thanks so much, Carol. I think, um, do you know when the rules are, might go in front of the State Board? This, the first reading was um, last Friday, okay. and it went very well. And then we have our second reading 
uh, the first Friday in July. Okay. And then it will be adopted and we have verified with State Board that they will be effective for September 1st. So they're looking at an implementation time of September 1st and I wanted to make sure if you guys have questions or any comments, um, let us know. Is there is there any information or kind of technical questions you'd like to ask? If there are, um, if Carol can answer them, of course she will, but if not, we'd be happy to figure out the information and get it back to you. Mm -hmm. So um, does anybody have any questions right now? So if I understood correctly, basically this has cut down about 200 rules? Correct. Great. Correct. And just made it, the, our whole purpose for doing this is to really make it easier for the eligibility workers to find the rules that they need to support their decisions. Um, it, it's really cumbersome to try and look through all of those rules. And the other thing that we're doing with the rules is we are numbering them like the other rules are being numbered. So now we have B4220.13 and we're going to do a 4.0 um, scale like uh, the adult financial sections are, um, like the HIPAA website has 8 point whatever it is. So we're going to kind of mirror that so that all of the rules are, are looking the same. Okay, great. Are there any questions or concerns that anyone has on the webinar or do you have ideas of how things could be simplified or anything like that going forward? We have been talking about the um, upcoming rule changes in other forums, such as the CWSC conference that was last week, in our PIP meetings that we hold with the 10 large counties. Um, and like I said, we do want to do a web-based training and we will have the future upcoming webinar um, with questions and answers after the information is posted to our portal on the CBMS website. Um, so hopefully when we get those questions ahead of time, we can have some really good answers for what's coming through. Um, and we'll know more about what the concerns are that the eligibility workers have. Of course, at the CWFC, the Fraud Council um, workshop, uh, their whole focus was on the new uh, change to the rent um, mm -hmm. and being able for our clients to just declare that and we won't have to verify it. Um, so we got some good feedback there, but uh, we did a lot of research before we decided to adopt that, and we think that it's going to be really beneficial for the clients and for our, our eligibility workers. Great. Thanks, Carol. Well, I'm not seeing any questions right now that have come up, so um, if you all do have questions or if you talk with your colleagues about this and more questions come up, please feel free to email Christine and I we'll be, or Carol and we'd be happy to answer them. And Carol, would you mind giving your email address? Sure. It's Carol Spink, S-P-I-N-K, that's carol.spink at state.co.us. And you can also email Amanda Dyer. She's the supervisor of the Food Assistance Policy Group. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Sure, thank you. And thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate your time and attention to this issue. And we look forward to seeing you on next month's webinar or hearing from you about any, any questions you may have about what's happening in food assistance. So thank you all for your time. Thank you.